Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it's time for Robservations, the show about something. I'm your host, the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, the master of fun and wonder, the existential Mr. Rogers, Mr. Robert Marbonette, and I have with me, as always, Gilbert the Gilbarian from the planet Gilbar. It's 100 degrees outside, ladies and gentlemen, 100 degrees. It's very hot. Uh, anyway, I'm here with the dogs. I'm here with y'all. Uh, first of all, I want to give a big uh, thank you to any new subscribers that have come over from Geeks and Gamers. I have had, I have to tell you, I feel like Sally Field at the Oscars. Uh, I have had more lovely messages and more, uh, Tallulah's here too, uh, more lovely messages from people uh, after my appearance with Jeremy on Geeks and Gamers than I think more affirmation. I mean, you know, Stuart Smalley used to give daily affirmations. I got more affirmations from Geeks and Gamers than I've received, I don't know in the last, uh, more than uh, the last 20 years of my life. So I want to thank you for everybody, all the new listeners, all the new viewers, all the new subscribers. Thank you very much. What a fine bunch you all are. And I I mean it sincerely. It was actually, it was very nice. It was very nice. Uh, you know, when you're banging your head against the wall trying to get things done here in Hollywood, getting nice affirmations from people is always a good thing. Which brings me to my next story. The, na the latest story. Oh, it's so hot in here. Um, it's very odd. Hey, Gilbert, look at this. Gilbert, uh, do, do you want to talk? Uh, oh, he, okay, you want something. You want a cookie? Look at this. You don't, you don't even, there's no pretense. Wait, wait, don't don't pull my microphone out. I know, I get the cookies. Look, you, you know when I talk, you get a cookie. You've turned into a ham. You've turned into a ham, Gilbert. You're a ham. And Tallulah gets a cookie, too. Oh, that was good. One and done. You know, one and done. I love it when Gilbert's a one and done kind of a guy because... Makes my job easier. Anyway, welcome again to episode number 258. And what I want to talk about, wow, I read an article that I want to share with you from Consequence of Sound, a great website if you haven't read it. Gilbert, come on, buddy. You can't, just because I'm on TV or on the internet, on YouTube, broadcasting live, uh, doesn't mean that he can monopolize my time. Wow. Uh, so anyway, as I wipe my brow in this heat, because... <laughs> Who turns on their air conditioning at the end of October? Anyway, so Consequences scout, Sound, Scout, uh, let's see, Tafoya, Scout Tafoya wrote this article on October 22nd. I love this article. It's a little long, but uh, I wanted to read it. Do you like superhero movies in defense of Scorsese, Coppola, and original filmmaking? And uh, I love this article, so I'm just going to... Let's just get it. Let's just jump into it. Uh, I'm going to do that. If you are reading this, you know what happened to film culture and the things promised in the headline are just the tip of the iceberg. A few months back, someone asked Pedro Almodovar, director of daring, of daring art like The Skin I Live In, Bad Education, and talked to her what he thought about comic book movies. And he said correctly, they weren't sexy enough. Leave it to Almodovar to say something like that. I love that he said that. Then they asked Martin Scorsese, director of Taxi Driver, Bringing Out the Dead, The Silence, and A or Silence, and Aviator, who said the recent crop of comic book movies weren't to his taste. And then they reminded him of the theme park rides, uh, that they reminded him more of theme park rides than cinema. Naturally, people took umbrage with their critiques, including directors James Gunn, Joss Whedon, Kevin Smith, who all argued that because they had spent a lot of time and money reading comic books or turning them into movies, these movies had to have legitimacy. This is a bit like arguing that a car runs well because you bought it. Gunn later took to Instagram to explain how back in the day, people like his father also said that Westerns or Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey were not up to snuff, as if that somehow leveled the playing field and made Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 art. And if that wasn't enough, a journalist rang up Francis Ford Coppola, a man who hasn't been able to scare up a dime from Hollywood in over 20 years, despite directing some of the consensus best motion pictures of all time, to bother him about the issue. Not surprisingly, Coppola came to the defense of Scorsese, a man with whom he once shared a commentary track on the 1940 Alexander Korda-produced Thief of Baghdad, and said that these movies were not cinema and, in fact, despicable. The same cadre of people who have brought, uh, bought houses with Disney money once again fell over themselves, trying to say that movies like Avengers Endgame were simply misunderstood. So by the time someone asked Ken Loach 
a two-time Palm d'Or winner who has sacrificed the best years of his life making movies about the struggles of the working class and who certainly had better things to do with his time than talk comics, the argument had reached a pointless and infuriating fever pitch. You may be wondering one or two things by this time. Why, for instance, do we keep asking directors in their 70s and 80s what they think of movies in which men in tactical gear fight space aliens? Why don't these old directors enjoy these movies about people in tactical gear fighting space aliens? How has this dialogue managed to take up so much of our lives? The answers are both simple and complicated. Comic book movies, no matter which juggernaut billionaire-run label you like better, are unfortunately here to stay. I say unfortunately, not because I want them to go away, but because they have conclusively eaten box office space that used to be open to, oh, anything else. Romantic comedies, historical epics, bizarro independent films, the kind of gross-out comedies Todd, Todd Phillips claims you can't make any more because you'll get arrested if you tell a dick joke. All of that used to coexist. Now... Critics sweat bullets, as I'm doing right now, hoping something like The Farewell or Parasite does well because it may promise that movies that haven't been approved by Disney, focus grouped a dozen times, overseen by branding specialists, and lit and performed identically may indeed return to screens more than a few times a year. Because right now, the most interesting movies play New York or L.A. for a week or two before they go right to Netflix. In fact, most original movies will never see the inside of a movie theater because Disney, who owns Marvel, and Time Warner, who owns DC, now monopolize movie theater screens. If you think I'm overreacting, that's fine. You've probably stopped reading or listening or are planning to re or, or are planning to really hand me my ass in the comment section I won't be reading. But do yourself this kindness before you assume I'm simply crying wolf. If you want to look at a list of movies released between the years 2000 and 2008 before Iron Man, yeah, a lot of garbage was released. But there was a healthy diet of actual movies to go with it. A lot of our oxygen was hijacked by the Lord of the Rings movies or the Star Wars prequels, but there was also a Wes Anderson movie or two. Singularly wrong-headed stabs at adult filmmaking like I Heart Huckabees or Garden State, and genuine oddities like Monkey Bone, Memento, Josie and the Pussycats, Freddy Got Fingered, and Bad Santa. Somewhere in there, Gore Verbinski becomes a megaforce in American mainstream filmmaking. Peter Himes flames out. Ben Stiller makes trillion-dollar high-concept comedies. There are 48 forgettable movies about the toll of the Iraq War, horror movies that have large budget and budgets, and Wolfgang Peterson is still employed. In short, a ton of different things get money. Now, if critics constantly seem surprised movies don't suck, look at what's playing at a theater near you. Box office figures supplanted critical reception completely sometime around 2013. Doesn't matter what critics say anymore. We've all become chaotic madmen or quixotic madmen trying to either keep up with the discourse that has left us behind or begging an indifferent and unreachable public to take a chance on a micro-budget avant-garde short by a black woman living in Georgia trying like hell to raise money for her first feature. Look up Labo, or let me put this, I'm, gonna, I'm going to put this in the, this is an actual woman filmmaker, and I'm going to say the author of this article says look her up. So here you go, look her up. That is in the chat now, so look her up. You won't regret it. Any more consensus is only useful if it flatters the mainstream. Notorious critic Armand White gets dragged every time he ruins the perfect Rotten Tomato score or whatever movie people like that week. Instead, he should get dragged for the time he accused the grieving Parkland parents of being crisis actors. That the public can only muster their anger when he says get out isn't good is indicative of what we've narrowed our understanding of a movie and criticism to include. If a movie doesn't have a 100% score on an insulting and reductive aggregate like Rotten Tomatoes, the complaint isn't even that some people might not be tempted to see the film. No, the issue is the perception of or pretense toward perfection. If Armand White, of all goddamn people, doesn't like some shiny object, then we can't show it off to the world like Steve Jobs debuting a phone that will stop working in two years. You can see why Coppola and Scorsese might be a little upset, even without factoring in that this narrowing, this turning all movies into tent poles, there were 60 American films this year that were either sequels, prequels, remakes, or adaptations of graphic novels, 
has made it impossible for them to even get something as middle brow as, say, the Rainmaker made today. Comic book movies all perform the same function on their audience. You may love or hate, say, Neil Jordan's Greta, or indeed Scorsese's The Irishman when it hits Netflix next month, but you cannot say that their intentions are the same as any other movie you'll watch that week. Tell me the functioning difference between the messaging behind Spider-Man Homecoming and Ant-Man. I dare you. I actually could, just so you know. Furthermore, these movies are hideously compromised as entertainment. The U.S. military gives equipment to and uses the characters from Marvel movies to recruit young people to join the service. They see something like Captain Marvel as a good advertisement for the Air Force. That's all the proof I need that these movies are, in fact, quite harmful forces in culture, even without everything above. But because I care about what Captain Marvel is destroying, I wrote all the stuff above. It's not even like Coppola and Scorsese are ethically uncompromised either. Coppola borrowed a bunch of the Filipino military to make Apocalypse Now while they were in the middle of a horrendous suppression campaign. And Scorsese let a mob enforcer reenact a murder he committed on screen in Casino. The thing is, though, those movies question everything in them, including their own megalomania as directors. Apocalypse Now is a movie about war as a fundamentally insane force, Inextric inextricable from the human condition and yet unthinkable. It also criticizes attempts to explain it, aware of its sheer scale. Veterans, like Arlie Ermey, hated it, even though, because, even though he's in it, because it made GIs look like drugged out maniacs. Casino and Goodfellas are about the same thing, basically, about the charismatic, charismatic monstrousness of organized crime and the way it subsumed every life it touched. To put this all into a more useful context, let me shoehorn Kevin Passmore's work, Fascism, a short introduction from the Oxford University Press. To me, Coppola and Scorsese subject their own assumptions and those of their colleagues to systematic criticism. And they try, if not always successfully, to uncover unacknowledged prejudices in their work. A proper scholarly method is intrinsically anti-fascist in that it treats skeptically what fascists regard as beyond criticism. Academic inquiry accepts that its insights depend on perspective, that other perspectives will be possible, and that their answers will always be superseded. This necessary mutual criticism can only happen in a democratic environment. Another helpful shorthand we should remember is that the first step on the road to fascism is that an idea cannot be criticized. What happens to all those critics who give your object a perfect score? What was the point of their writing the nice review to begin with if all you needed were 100 people to write what you already believed? Am I making myself conspicuous? What does Scorsese, whose work has been relegated to a few weeks in an art house theater and an unceremonious release on Netflix, just slightly better treatment than the movie The Tall Girl received? Oh, to comic book movies. What does Coppola, who had to finance his last three movies with money he made selling wine because Hollywood won't give him the time of day, despite directing the Godfather trilogy, owe comic book movies and their overly sensitive purveyors? The deeply offensive thing here is that guys like Gunn and Phillips owe their entire playbook to people like Scorsese. Without Mean Streets, there's no Guardians of the Galaxy. Without Taxi Driver, no Joker. And yet it isn't enough for them. It's never enough. We must only talk about these movies positively. We must all spend money to see them so they can continue being made. We must never, ever review them negatively, for that might crack their utterly meaningless Rotten Tomatoes score. It's not enough that there's one, th one in theaters every three weeks with a kajillion dollar ad campaign online and on billboards. It's not enough that everywhere you go, someone will ask you if you watched whatever the newest insufferable thing is. It's not enough that critics have to review these movies anew if, as if they aren't written, lit, directed, costumed, production designed, art directed, and sanitized in exactly the same fashion. It isn't enough that they're being used to trick people into joining the Air Force and we have to just sit and pretend they're art instead of nefarious fascist instruments. None of it is ever enough. James Gunn Instagram post complaining that his father said that Star Wars and 2001 A Space Odyssey were both boring. 
He misses the fundamental point of his own story. James Gunn's father had enough art that he didn't need to watch sci-fi to feel like he was living his best life. That, it seems, is unthinkable today. You must watch and then respect the comic book movie or you will be sat in a chair like Alex DeLarge while men, always men, explain to you why you're wrong to dissent. James Gunn is now making Star Wars for all intents and purposes, and his symbolic father figure still won't watch it. What did he think was going to happen? Something else bothers me about this idea because some people don't like Westerns. That means all people need to like something now, or that someday we'll live in a world where everyone agrees that Suicide Squad and the Sistine Chapel are of equal worth. Critics today? Plenty of them also like The Searchers or Day of the Outlaw or whatever old movie you want to throw down as having been similarly misunderstood in its time. Are Marvel fans watching these movies too? Have they done anything to examine the cinematic history that laid the groundwork for their new favorite movies? Because Scorsese has. He's financed restorations of obscure art house and classic Hollywood alike. He reintroduced the world to landmarks of Polish cinema because he wanted to. And he spent more time talking about Westerns than anyone currently using them as a cudgel against Scorsese's attitude. Westerns have been dealt with and sifted through by a cultural apparatus still hard at work right now. There weren't 58 movies identical to The Searchers that pushed Written on the Wind to home video without a theatrical window. Fans of John Wayne didn't throw tantrums when he didn't get an Oscar for Rio Lobo. And just in case, just in case it needs to be heard once again for the people in the back, critics made Westerns legitimate, not the will of the people. Your dad may love the good, the bad, and the ugly, but he didn't make it a classic. Thoughtful examination of its mise-en-scene did. Writers who said this film above all other spaghetti westerns did. If you reduce critical opinion to a score, you're depriving yourself of ways of seeing, and you're helping turn film into product graded like meat and made to give you the exact same feeling every time. I'm not merely over the era of the blockbuster comic book movie and its absolutely terrible effect on what people understand criticism to be. I am over the instance that I have to have an opinion about a slew of movies made with complete indifference to my experience. I want to be able to tell my figurative son, James Gunn, that I saw his movie when it was called Batman Begins and it was boring then too, and then get on with my day. But I can't because my day consists of seeing take after take after take on this same subject and the movies themselves aren't even worth it and i'm a professional critic this is my job can you imagine how coppola feels he just wanted to make art that criticized every institution and impulse to which we laid claim and we did this to him we turned him into an interchangeable and wholly expected breaking development in a 24-hour news cycle about movies so dull i wouldn't show them to children Scorsese made Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Coppola made Rumblefish. Almodovar made Pain and Glory. Ken Loach made Land and Freedom. These movies re reward repeat viewings and close readings. They're carefully designed, color graded, costumed, written, and directed because their makers wanted us to have real, meaningful art. Some of them, they gave away, gave away their souls to do so for us. What have DC and Marvel given us? Recruitment ads, children's toys, and guarantees that this wretched, endless discourse will never end. Here's the thing. I hated that article that I just read. I thought the reviewer was a pompous ass, to be honest. But he had good points to make. On one hand, Coppola and Scorsese are absolutely cinists that understand the entire history of cinema. And as our reviewer, as the, the article, uh, Scout uh, Tafoya brought up, the, uh, the author of this article, Scout said that, of course, it was critics who later recontextualized the work of Sergio Leone once perhaps dismissed, I'd like to look into that and see what the reviews of the day said, but it wasn't until critics started to analyze his spaghetti westerns, specifically the good, the bad, and the ugly, that they were elevated to high art, as if audiences who enjoyed those films first run didn't understand that themselves. We don't need critics to tell us what we like and what we don't, because we know 
what we like and what we don't. That is not to say that I don't love great film criticism because I do. I love great film criticism. I love, you know, one of the last things I did with John Schnepp, they were they were closing a movie bookstore in Burbank, Movie World. It was this dank, musty bookstore that had been there for decades, floor to ceiling, full of old books and magazines and papers and all kinds of stuff. And I love going in there. One of the last things I bought when I was with John Schnepp was a huge book of Pauline Kael's reviews, decades worth of reviews, thousands of reviews. It's a book I, I keep handy. I like to look at all the time to find out, ooh, well, I wonder what Pauline Kael thought about Excalibur or, or Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And sometimes I agree with her and sometimes I don't. But what was really interesting was her view of the films was different than my view. And I... I tended, uh, I tended, I tend, tend, tended. I learned something from her analysis. So whether I agreed with her or not, I enjoyed her analysis. I enjoyed reading something that's contrary to my own beliefs because it helps me figure out what I believe. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's, it's, it's a great thing. Now, the fact that the Marvel Cinematic Universe and indeed comic book movies have become so popular today is not a bad thing. And there is, I think, a deep prejudice about these movies and about what they are that we're already there. These reviewers, I don't think Scout uh, Tafoya grew up reading comics or watching, say, Batman the Animated Series. Because if you did, if you were captivated by comic books as a youth, as I was, you couldn't help but dream of the day where you could see these movies on the big screen. And, and we put up with a lot before we got here that, let's face it, were not exactly examples of, of high art. I mean, anyone that goes and looks at Steel, the movie Steel, which was amazing because Steel is actually based on the reign of the Superman storyline, where John Henry, the, the character that became Steel, that's who Shaquille O'Neal is playing in that movie. And it, it comes out of one of the most celebrated comic stories of the 90s, the death of Superman and then reign of the Superman. And they made a movie from it. I mean, it's not an exact adaptation, but the in, that incarnation of the character definitely came from one of the most popular stories, comic book stories of the era in which it was released. And I can't believe that somebody made that film. But they did. Was it good? No. I, but I do find it fascinating that that got made. Same way I find I love that Halle Berry, Catwoman, meant something to her growing up because of Eartha Kitt's portrayal. I mean, you had Lee Merriweather, you had Julie Newmar, you had Eartha Kitt. And, uh, you know, it was amazing that Eartha Kitt's character inspired a woman of color, Halle Berry, to go want to make Catwoman. So is that a bad thing? I, I think not. Catwoman's a bad movie. Although, how bad can it be with Sharon Stone in it? But it's interesting that that now there are all of these people coming out against comic book movies as a genre, a genre simply because they're popular. And the idea that these movies are, are somehow just slapped together in some cookie-cutter assembly line fashion is pretty silly. Sure, there is a, a, a style of Marvel films because they're all part of the same universe. So it makes sense that the palette is that's used is 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 a real world palette. It's not a Zack Snyder painterly palette that was used in Batman v Superman whose stylization was a much a part as much a part of Zack's style as anything else. But the Marvel Cinematic Universe has decided to do a number of of things and that that is one of them is to make the real world appear real. So the fantastical can be have added weight. And now that they've moved into the cosmic realm, they've gone incredibly stylized. And, and this, this comic book color palette, look at Guardians. I mean, Guardians has a great, very distinct look to it. And when they travel to different planets, the planets all look different, vibrant, beautiful. They have their own palette. Guardians does not look like any other science fiction film that came before. So to write these things off, to write off the directors, to write off the, the filmmakers, to write off the studio, to write off Kevin Feige, is a mistake. And, and I, 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 I think, I understand, the fact that 
our movie going experience is not as diverse as it used to be is sad. The fact that I don't get the hunt for red October in a theater anymore, or a movie like that is sad, but I'm getting an Amazon series about Jack Ryan. So, and it's a much longer series than say a Jack Ryan movie was instead of two hours, I get eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours, whoever, I don't know how long the next series is going to be. But everybody's bitching and moaning and complaining. I get it. I think everybody needs to diversify their cinematic tastes lately. Um, it's sad for me that that so few of, 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 of the things that I grew up loving, like I talk to people about all that jazz, a movie that's about a creative man, a director of both Broadway, stage, and movies. I think I've seen all that jazz a hundred times. It's one of my favorite movies in the world. There's so few people now that know it, much less could I get them to watch it. And if you do watch it, let me recommend the awesome Criterion Blu-ray. Maybe it's on the Criterion channel. It's one of my favorite movies ever made. I believe David Fincher said it was his favorite movie of all time, too. It's, a, it's the movie that made me want to be an editor. And it's also the movie that made me want to direct. Even though the main character, Joe Gideon, played by Roy Scheider, who's absolutely one of my favorite actors of all time, it's his best role, yes, even more so than Sheriff Brody. But it's just an incredible film, and I can't get people to watch it today. I wish they would. You Imagination Connoisseurs, check out all that jazz. I guarantee you, not only is it a great movie about the artistic impulse, it's also a great fantasy film. Not a fantasy movie like Lord of the Rings, but a fantasy movie where basically the angel of death is one of the main characters in the film, played by the delightful and luscious Jessica Lange. But you got to check it out. I just, this, this, it's so interesting that, that the Marvel Cinematic Universe that has done nothing but provide pleasure for people, that has a very high level of people working on it, the caliber of the films have been amazing. They set out more, more, what's more miraculous is they set out to create a cinematic universe that had never been done, like the likes of which had never been seen ever in cinematic history. And they did it. They sat down and they did what they set out to do. And is that something that shouldn't exactly be held up aloft as like, look, man, this had never happened before. Never happened before. And it did. It did. And it, it, it why is that not something to respect and honor? Is it is it their fault that what they did was done so well that it's become popular? No. Has the Marvel Cinematic Universe somehow suppressed your ability to get all of these movies? No. It's not like the article making the rounds today about how Disney is putting Fox movies on a shelf. They can't even be played at repertory theaters anymore. What are they going to do with Rocky Horror? Do they realize Rocky Horror is a 20th Century Fox movie? I don't know. Tim Curry is now a Disney princess, as has been pointed out many times. But I think it's, you know... It's just strange to me that that it's so like the worst thing, the, the most obvious thing is to go after something that's popular and blame that popularity for somehow diminishing the rest of culture. There's so much out there. There's so much available to watch. And right now we're going through a phase in our history where comic book movies are popular. They're providing family, family entertainment. Almodovar, Almodovar is correct. I mean, I would love to see, to be honest, I would love to see a comic book film that incorporated an awesome, steamy, body heat-like or basic instinct-like or coming home-like, whatever your favorite non-pornographic sex scene is. I would love to see, let's see Captain America hook up with, I don't know, Black Widow. Let's see a, a really steamy, hard R sex scene with these beautiful sculpted bodies that the studio paid to have them go on workout regimens. I mean... Chris Evans is a beautiful guy. Scarlett Johansson is a beautiful woman. They're, they're ripped up and toned when they make the Marvel movies. Give me a steamy, long, gratuitously shot sex scene between them so I can oogle both of their bodies because they're beautiful specimens of humanity. And why not watch them get it on? Well, you're not going to see that in a Marvel movie, nor I don't think should you. I might want to see it. You know, you can see, if you want to see Scarlett Johansson in all her glory, you can watch the science fiction film Under the Skin. Of course, she's, spoiler alert, an alien observing mankind, but so it's not exactly the most sexual thing in the world. But we're not going to see that. Almodovar is right. 
we're not going to see sexy Marvel movies because that's not what they are. And that's okay. I can go watch Almodovar movies himself, and so should you or myself because they're good. Anyway, uh, I just thought that was an article that is worth sharing. And if you guys want to read it again and you're interested in it, I'm putting it in the chat. Here you go. Read it, weep or not. Anyway, you know, I just don't understand why. What is what is uh, what does Chris say on the John Campia so show? Why do you have to yuck another person's yum? Why yuck another person's yum? I don't know. I don't understand. I wanted to see Marvel movies my whole life. Now I'm getting them. You know, I might be closer to death than ever before, but I still love the fact that I have all the Marvel movies on 4K Blu-ray, well, with the exception of Avengers and Age of Ultron. But I will rectify that at some point. Uh, <laughs> this is a Vulture article by uh, Bilge uh, Abiri. Bilge Abiri. Is this a real article? I don't know. Uh, this article is from, uh, uh, I guess it's from today. It's 6.34 p.m. Or yesterday, 6.34 p.m. Fine. Okay, let's talk about Marvel. So here's what Bilge has to say. So I guess this is our new reality in which every director of a certain age must be asked for their thoughts on Marvel. The current wave of interrogations started earlier this month when Martin Scorsese, currently doing press for his Netflix release, The Irishman, opined that Marvel movies were not cinema. Honestly, the closest I can think of them, as well-made as they are, with actors doing the best they can under the circumstances, is theme parks, he said, in words that have since been echoed on every corner of the internet. Then Francis Coppola chimed in. Naturally, each round of the latest criticism has brought forth waves of Marvel fans and even a few Marvel directors. Oh, and oh, look, Disney head Bob Iger has chimed in as well. I say, bring it on. Keep the takes coming. Let's have this effing debate. I've been writing about comic book and superhero and franchise films for decades now. I've had to watch and rewatch them as a writer, a fan, a parent. I don't entirely agree with our greatest auteur's dismissal of them. I've enjoyed my share of comic book movies, and I've even included a couple of them amongst their respective decades' best. As industrial phenomena, they've allowed some directors to gain the clout to go on and make smaller films, presumably more personal pictures, as Taika Waititi did when he recently followed up Thor Ragnarok with Jojo Rabbit. Directors are always saying they're going to follow up their big blockbusters with something smaller and more intimate. They rarely do, but rarely do they actually do it. We've been waiting for George Lucas's experimental movies for four decades, and I've been impressed with the occasional subtlety these films have provided, particularly on the way they... Ah, you see what's happening here? I sound like a hostage, grateful that my captors occasionally let me eat a nice meal. It's the Stockholm Syndrome writ large across an entire cultural industry and its consumers. And I think that this might be what the Justice League of Aging Auteurs is really rebelling against. Scorsese and Coppola and Loach and that ghost of Sam Peckinpah I recently interviewed during a seance might find Marvel lacking in artistry and soul, but I suspect that what they're really responding to is the underlying reason why they were asked about Marvel movies in the first place. The superhero and more generally the IP-driven blockbuster subgenres complete and utter dominance of today's cinematic landscape. These are not filmmakers given to outrageous pronouncements. They continue to function in an industry alongside craftspeople and actors who've probably worked on or hope to work on a blockbuster or two. A Spider-Man was the star of Scorsese's last picture. His co-stars were Kylo Ren and Qui-Gon Jinn. The one before that starred Harley Quinn. His latest co-stars Rogue. If these directors are speaking up, that probably means they're feeling a certain alarm on their end, a growing sense that the things that made their chosen art form what it was is dying, replaced by something ominous and totalizing. There's one thing Scorsese said that really sticks out. Speaking of Marvel movies, he said they were creating another kind of audience that thinks cinema is that. All great films create their own audience in a sense. 
You can't really broaden the art form's range of expression without teaching your audience new ways to experience and think and feel about what's on screen, and by extension, the universe beyond the frame. Citizen Kane does this. Rauschenmann does this. 2001 does this. Do the Right Thing does this. And let's not just forget the capital M masterpieces that do it either. Anna Rose Holmer's The Fitz does this. Chloe Zhao's The Rider does this. And Robert Greene's Actress does this. I could go on, but we'd be here all day. Superhero movies have done this to some extent, too. In a sci-fi thriller parlance, they've terraformed their own audience. But they haven't really expanded our capacity for feeling. If anything, they've limited it, delivering tales of moral clarity with ready-made mix-and-match character interactions. There are occasional exceptions. Black Panther's Killmonger might technically be a bad guy, but he's a deeply moving one. And Thanos is the saddest villain like ever. And can Captain America's BFF, the Winter Soldier, still be an okay guy if he also killed Iron Man's parents? Well, he was brainwashed at the time, so. But by and large, in their movies, nuance is an occasional grace note, not the norm. It's understandable that Coppola and Scorsese might be somewhat alarmed and dispirited by all of this, especially since their work has always been about dubious people. Scorsese's characters are, among other things, killers and abusive lunatics, and he makes us care about them, even find them charismatic. In these works, nuance and discomfort are the norm, and it's moral clarity that's rare. Of all the many people killed in Coppola's first two Godfather movies, only like two of them probably deserve it. Well, okay, I'm not going to read. This article is really long, and I really like it, and I'm going to share the link right here. And I think it is a great article. But basically, what I find about all of this, oh, did I not? Uh, there you go. There's the link in the chat. What I find about all of this that's interesting is the debate, is the fact that whether you're coming to the defense of Marvel movies, whether you believe it, whether it's funny to me to see anybody talk about Scorsese and Coppola in less than glowing terms, and that they're old men and they have nothing to say, considering they are basically the two goats that are still alive. There's many others. There's a lot of goats, but uh, they, they're up there. And how would you ever say that they have nothing to offer? Because they do. But the point is, is that we're talking about it, is that people like these, the, the two articles I read today are deep dives into this conversation. And I would like to apply this conversation to Star Wars to the Fast and the Furious, to Harry Potter, to any of our large, ongoing tentpole concerns that people are railing either for or against. It's very interesting. And I think what I like about all these debates is that they're making people, every time somebody brings up a classic movie in one of these articles, it makes me hope that, hey, there's going to be people that are going to go find that movie and watch it. You know, Elizabeth, I tried to show Elizabeth Watchmen, the long version, the, the ultimate cut with the Tales of the Black Freighter sequences. She just wasn't for her. You know, completely tuned out. Didn't dig it. She said I tried to show it to her once before, but we didn't get very far. And she thought it was boring and didn't understand anything that was happening. I was trying to give her a little primer uh, about she liked the first episode of the Watchmen series. So I was trying to go back and explain where it all where it all comes from, where it all might be going. Different strokes for different folks. But what's interesting is that we're having these conversations. We are having these debates. And I think it's I think it's great. I think it's awesome. And um, I can't complain about that. So let's see what anybody has to say. Uh, factual opinions here. Thoughts on the TNG episode, The Chase. Uh, the Chase is, I believe, a six-season Next Gen episode that was actually the first appearance, I think, yeah, Salome Jens, who played the alien at the end of the chase, ended up being the lead founder in Deep Space Nine. What I love Salome Jens is because she was in one of my favorite, and it is a science fiction movie, one of my favorite science fiction movies of the 60s, John Frankenheimer's Seconds. If you guys haven't seen Seconds, it's, first of all, it's black and white, but shot by James Wong Howitz, you know, one of the great 
<clears throat> black and white DPs, Andre Alakan uh, and uh, James Wong Howe, man. Guy's amazing. If you haven't seen Seconds, it's basically about a middle-aged schlep rock who hates his life, who goes to a company that rebuilds his body and build, builds him into Rock Hudson, gives him a new identity, a whole new life. He gets to go move out to the West Coast from the East Coast, and it's about what happens after that. And it is an incredible science fiction film. It's John Frankenheimer is one of my favorite directors. And, and while, you know, he had a rough time of it after his period in the 60s, but the guy was, he was Birdman of Alcatraz, The Train, Seven Days in May, The Manchurian Candidate, Seconds. The guy was killing it in the 60s, and all of his movies in the 60s are worth watching. Yes, I know he directed Prophecy, the monster movie. I get that. And I understand that he directed, well, he directed French Connection 2. He still was an amazing director. But so anyway, The Chase. There's an idea that was put forward in the original series, specifically in the episode The Paradise Syndrome, I think written by Margaret Armin. That was the episode with Miramani where Kirk becomes an Indian god. Well, they have these obelisks. Uh, basically, it's an asteroid deflector, and you find out one of the one of the things that they developed, and certainly has been developed in the novels, Star Trek novels, is the idea that there was a race that are called in Star Trek lore the Preservers, and the question of why are there so many humanoid species in the Milky Way galaxy is the galaxy was seeded um, by the Preservers, and they left people all around the galaxy. So these Preservers left on this planet these basically american indians indigenous people that we meet and they built an asteroid deflector in case one was needed because they knew what was going to happen so they left technology around and the chase is an episode that definitely plays into that idea and i, I don't want to ruin it's a, it's a great episode it's pretty quick it's a quick episode it seems fast for everything it's packing in there but um it's good it's it's really good i really like that episode uh, check it out. Dave Atkins says, finally got my retro Dreamcast running again via HDMI to celebrate 20 years. Good times. Man, I never played Dreamcast, but people love the Dreamcast system. So, Dave, good on you, sir. Uh, what games are you playing? Um, Emil Johansson says, Emil, obviously, Emil, a, a longtime member of this Post Geek Singularity. Emil Johansson, Johansson says, the MCU fans are not necessarily movie fans. Well, if you're fans of the MCU, I think you are movie fans. And maybe if those are the only movies you watch, that doesn't mean you're not a movie fan. Uh, I uh, I really like uh, <clears throat> the MCU, but I'm a big movie fan too. But look, I think if, if the MCU becomes someone's gateway drug to movies, that's a good thing. You know, everybody, I, I was reading horror and science fiction. I started reading, my dad was reading James Blish Star Trek episode adaptations to me. That's what got me interested in reading. So then I branched out. So you never know. I mean, if people are, are, are fans of cinema, they will find other things. I promise. Uh, Chris Provoto is here. What's your gut feeling on, do you think films like Victor Victoria or Blazing Saddles would be made in today's culture or with the same tones as good movies? Good question, Chris. Uh, the, the humor, here's, here's what, what I think has happened to our culture that is detrimental. Somehow we have forgotten that you can be a compassionate, caring person, but you can also be humorous and make fun of everything. Everything should be made fun of. And, you know, that's not to say you shouldn't also be compassionate. And there is more inclusion and more awareness of, of things like ageism, racism, sexism, genderism, religiousism, or whatever, uh, than ever before. And yet everyone is so quick to be angered when really things are better now than they've ever been. Blazing Saddles is a movie that is going to trigger a lot of people now, especially younger people that don't understand that you need to be able to laugh at yourself as well as be mindful of yourself at the same time. And I I, I loved Victor Victoria. 
I also love Blazing Saddles and still do. But I I know there are people that are going to be deeply offended if they watch those movies for the first time for whatever reason. But you have to understand, I mean, those movies, if nothing else, stand as a evolutionary culturally how does our how does our culture grow and evolve they're evolu they're cultural evolutionary markers or whatever however you'd call that that idea and when you watch them you should understand like okay blazing saddles came out in the early 70s and the humor the body humor i mean it's 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 i don't mean body i mean body um it, it's so weird like we want to deny our own human nature you know we're we're on one hand does everybody want to be respected and not treated like a piece of meat? Yes. But on the other hand, I don't want to live in a world where I can't lust after a pretty girl. I don't. That doesn't mean I have to be a douchebag. I can lust after a pretty girl in a respectful manner. But I don't want the idea that my desire to be with a woman ever has to be suppressed because that desire is somehow toxic masculinity. No, that's how I'm, by that's how I'm made. That's how I was biologically constructed. I am biologically engineered through evolution and years and millennia of time to, to work the way I work. Now, that doesn't mean that I shouldn't control myself, but there are there are, there is the reality of my existence that I can't, it's not going to go anywhere. You want to pretend it's not there? Okay, that's fine on you, but it is. And if you want to pretend that that's how society should be, no. What you do is you figure out how do we, how do we channel our nat natural inclinations into ways that are are still there, but you know, aren't necessarily causing me to catcall every pretty girl I see walking down the street, which isn't cool. But you know, the people that can't deal with humor anymore are 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 losing out. They are losing out because it's humor that makes us look at ourselves with a smile rather than take ourselves too seriously. Because sometimes it's better. If we're a little bit self-deprecating with one another, that way it fosters more communication than it does if you're holier than thou. But it's interesting. I'm glad that I grew up in a time when I could watch Blazing Saddles with my friends in high school or junior high and laugh our asses off. Um, and I do think those movies were good movies. And there was a reason they got made. And I think that it's it's important to go back. And whenever you're watching something, you have to take in its cultural context. When, when was it made? Why was it made? What was the world like? You know, to go back and pillory somebody like Lillian Gish because she was in a movie now that is, it's, she's an actress. She took a job. You know, uh, the world was a different place back then. It's like, do we want to admit that slavery didn't exist in North America for 200 years before I mean, there, four, there was, we celebrated recently, or celebrated is a dubious word, but we marked the, it had been the, the 400th anniversary happened this year of when the first slaves were brought to North America. 400 years ago. I mean, there were slaves for 200 years before America was really America. And you can't ever not talk about that or say that that didn't happen because it did. Our legacy of slavery happened. And to go back, and if you wanted to make a movie that took place 400 years ago and address that very issue, you should be able to do that. And people shouldn't be like, you can't talk about these things. Well, certainly you can. They happened. They should be addressed. <laughs> Warren Wright says, keep the beard growing, bruh. Well, you know what? I'm I'm, I'm doing it because I'm going to make a Lucky Tiger commercial, a sponsorship Lucky Tiger commercial. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shave myself. See, I don't know. You know, I look like Santa Claus. I get the big bushy beard. I don't know if I dig it. It's too, it's too just, uh, I don't know. But I'll keep it going for a while. <laughs> Thanks for that. I have many letters, ladies and gentlemen. Many, many, many letters. And I'm going to read some of this. Uh, this one is from Chris Rigglesworth. You've heard from him before. Hey, Rob, as theater experiences frequently come up, I thought today that I would write about one that I once had. It, evolves, it involves a growing trend which I just can't stomach. I'm not sure if it has been addressed on your show before, but I will apologize for the length of this letter, but I can be silent no longer. I hate assigned seating in movie theaters. Oh my God, I love it. I love assigned seating. Assigned seating, reserved seating, etc. whatever they want to call it, I find it to be a royal pain in the ass. There, I said it. I'm well aware that my position is not popular, 
I know that Mr. Campia has sung its praises ad nauseum on his show, and I've often seen in chats some people say they won't go to a theater that doesn't have assigned seating. Well, I'm here to tell you that it isn't all it's cracked up to be, and here's why. A few years ago, one of my local theaters had just recently renovated and added assigned seating. I was in a rare position that my wife and kids were out of town, and I could catch a nice, raunchy adult comedy without having to worry about getting home too late. I still had to work early the next day, but I figured, what the heck, I'll catch the 7 o'clock show, and in this case, it was Sausage Party which I had been dying to see since I first heard a review of it come out of, I think it was the South by Southwest Film Festival. Well, I got there and bought my ticket. I picked a seat and entered the theater. Shortly after the preview started, a couple came in and after studying their ticket for quite some time, politely asked me how the seating worked. I was in their seat. When I pulled my ticket stub out, I saw that I was in the right seat in the wrong theater. The box office had by accident sold me a ticket not to Sausage Party, but to War Dogs. By the time I went out, and the box office employee found a manager to make the correction, there was no decent seats left. I picked the best one they had available only to have someone sitting in that one when I got to the theater. Apparently, two friends bought their tickets separately and wanted to sit together when they got there, so the poor guy had to move and his friend remained beside me. One, I needed to brush up. Oh, one, he needed to brush up on his pers personal hygiene and he reeked. And two, he kept grumbling because I made his buddy move. Additionally, at that point, we were already a good 20 minutes into the movie. I was so put off by the whole situation, I couldn't even tell you what happened in it, and I haven't seen Sausage Party ever since. When I voiced my dissatisfaction to the management afterwards, they said they'd give me a free ticket to the next show, which was at 10.30 p.m. I couldn't take them up on it since I wouldn't have gotten home until almost 1 a.m., and I had to be at work before 6 a.m. with an hour drive. Not worth it for one movie. I later contacted their corporate offices and got in touch with an executive. He offered a free show of Sausage Party on a different day, but I politely declined, explaining that I was not able to get away to see a non-family-friendly film whenever, and that was a rare day off of freedom for me. I also explained that I wasn't calling to get movies or anything else for free, nor was I seeking a refund, just for them to consider that assigned seating does not work for every customer. He reluctantly admitted that they had received that same feedback more than they suspected they would. He said that the next time I came back, they would take care of me, to which I responded, you let me know when they stop assigned seating and I'll be back. Well, I have been back to that theater. The topic has come up in conversation for me several times, most recently with my son's karate instructor, and I'm surprised to learn that I'm not alone in my disdain for this practice. Apparently, the idea of getting to the theater early and getting a good seat is still popular. Often, people may decide to go see a movie on the day. Therefore, having prepared in advance to select a seat is not always an option, and it really isn't fair that some lazy person can grab a good seat online days in advance and come in late when others take the initiative to get there early and on time. Also, if I find myself near idiots with cell phones, people who need a washing their woolies, had garlic for lunch, or have obnoxious children, I can simply get up and move without having to leave the theater and get a new seat assigned. It's much more practical and a lot less of a headache. Okay, I'm done ranting. I know this is probably the way of the future. Maybe I'm just old-fashioned, as I'm also a middle-aged man with one foot in the grave. <laughs> but I will continue to frequent general admission theaters as long as they're available. For me, selecting the best seat when walking into a theater is a valuable part of the movie-going experience. I bid you and all of my fellow imagination connoisseurs the best day. Take care, Chris. Well, Chris, uh, I have to disagree with you. Luckily, I mean, I live in, in Los Angeles and we have a lot of premium theaters here. And most of the time when I'm going, I like to go opening night to the big movies I really want to see. And uh, I want to see it with other fans that are just as into it as I am. So the people that are going to these movie screenings, uh, it, it for me, it's a lot less stressful to buy a, an assigned seat so I know where I'm sitting rather than try and get there on the day and get in line hours in advance and wonder like where am I going to be in the line can I get the seat I'm going to get into I love the fact I can roll in five minutes before showtime I've got my seat I'm all good to go but that's a different experience most of the people in LA who are cineasts you know they're upscale members of the community so you don't usually have to deal with talking kids, people on their phones, because everybody there is there to see the movie. And I find it, uh, I find the public, my fellow moviegoers are, are the best police force ever when it comes to shaming people who would dare take out their phones or even show up. Most of the people wouldn't show up freshly washed or at least, you know, if, if they're not freshly washed, they're not reeking of garlic or anything else. But I understand 
isn't isn't it hasn't it always been said that hell is other people um so i do like assigned seating and i find like if i go see something i went to a midweek show of the lighthouse well a monday night show of the lighthouse with elizabeth and my friend dave hargrove and while it was i'd say the theater was half full it was a monday night at 9 30 and um but usually you know even when i choose assigned seats and i go midweek and even even a movie that's in its first week if you go midweek I found that there, I always try and get assigned seats where there's empty seats on either side of me. So I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of the of the the assigned seating. But I understand how you might not be. That that is um that is something I definitely I definitely can understand. Definitely can understand. But I really like assigned seating. Michael Morgan is here. Michael Morgan sent me a letter that says, Rob, I was watching the John Campion show today. You mentioned that you couldn't order a 3D copy of Spider-Man Far From Home. Just like Spider-Verse, I found that only Amazon Germany is offering it. It doesn't come out until December, so you still have time to order it. Keeping 3D movies alive, one overpriced Blu-ray at a time. Laugh out loud. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for, well, first of all, thinking of my well-being. Uh, I very much appreciate that. Yes, I... I did pre-order it on uh, Amazon UK, but there was no release date for it. So knowing that Germany has it coming out, one of the things I love about Germany um, is their very high QC standards as far as home video is concerned. Germany, uh, when you buy video transfers from Germany, for the most part, they're quite good. Now, what am I talking about? So as a post-production supervisor, one of my jobs is to make sure that what are called deliverables get handed over to whatever distributor is putting out the movie. If I'm not, if I'm working for a studio or whatever, I have to help prep the deliverables and deliverables are whatever format, whether you need uh, a theatrical version, a DCP, whether you need whatever you need to deliver the, the, to the distributor so they can show it wherever they're going to show it. Well, Germany has very, very strict what are called QC or quality control standards. So whenever you deliver a movie somewhere, now it's usually a file, a file, somebody has to look at it. Somebody literally throws it up on scopes, throws it up on a screen, and has to sit and watch it And for, for any kind of picture or sound problems, no matter what they are. They could be the tiniest thing or big things, and it has to pass QC before it's accepted. And uh, I am a big fan. Germany has very strict QC standards. I think the highest in the world. So whenever you buy something, whenever you buy home entertainment or anything on video from Germany, it's usually of the very highest caliber, which is nice. Sometimes, however, German, a lot of movies, foreign films are dubbed. And there have been times when I've bought things from Germany, they're dubbed in German and they do not have the original English language audio track. That's when I want to pry out my teeth with pliers. But for the most part, I've always had great, uh, great luck buying discs from Germany. Big fan. Uh, here is a letter that comes from B. Sweaty. <laughs> B. Sweaty writes, Hello, Rob. This is my first letter. I started watching you on Heroes with the big sweaty himself, John Schnepp, and followed you on Campia, and that led me here to Rob's observations. I'm a huge fan and love the positivity you bring to fans. Thank you for what you do. I was originally going to write to you about one of my guilty pleasures, the movie Battleship. <laughs> <laughs> I believe at one point you and Campia said this was a bad movie, but I can't help it. I just love it. Now on to my main point. I just watched you on Geeks and Gamers. In fair disclosure, I watch a lot of Jeremy's videos. I don't always agree with his take on things, but I do respect him a lot. And your channel being one of my favorites, I couldn't wait to see you both together. Let me just say that chat you both had was one of my favorite all-time videos to date. It was a delight, and you both set the example of how us fans should behave. My hope is that some of uh, my hope is some of the respect you both showed each other and the geeky love you demonstrated. We did geek out. Uh, will inspire others to follow your lead. Thank you so very much for all you do, and stay sweaty, my friend. Best wishes, Bob Cox, aka Be Sweaty. Well, Bob, what a delightfully nice letter. I, I thank you for for writing in. I mean taking the time to even go to the website and write a letter, much less send it in. I, I very much appreciate that. And thank you for the very kind words. You know, I, I really, I was surprised by the outpouring of support 
from going on Jeremy's channel. It's funny because, you know, I've gone on Midnight's Edge and and I've mentioned that I've watched Jeremy and I, you know, I watch Doomcock and I, I love Gary Beekler's channel, Nerdrotic. And um, I've watched a lot of these fandom menace channels. And it's surprising to me that that people were surprised that I did because I, I like hearing fan voices, you know, and, and, and hearing what people have to say. It's not, I don't, why would I want to watch people that I agree with all the time? How would I learn anything from that? I already know what I think. So I'm curious to see what the majority or what the what the fandom is a giant rainbow of opinions. And I, I certainly like hearing those opinions. And I got to tell you, man, you know, I look at YouTubers and I guess like I don't I don't consider myself a professional YouTuber, even though I do it, you know, consistently. And I certainly augment i'm not gonna lie augmenting this income is, is by doing this is helpful but you know it's hard work i look at john campy who's totally a professional full-time youtuber john busts his ass and he gets up at like five in the morning he sends me notes on what we're going to talk about he's making graphics i've learned a lot from him and he's constantly buying new equipment and upgrading things and making his show better so people that have become professional YouTubers, whether it's Jeremy, whether it's uh, Gary Beekler, Nerdrotic, I have a, a, a lot of respect because you know what? I mean, it's exhausting. If I go on John's show, I go on this show. I'm like yesterday, I did my show, John's show. I did the Weekly Hero. I, 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 look, I can't understand how people could talk. I don't understand how I've been, this, this is the 258th show. That, I'm like, 258 shows? Well, if nothing else, it shows consistently consistency. And you know what? No matter what I talk about every day, I still get four down votes at least. And it's like, I get it. But I think it's funny that somebody would take the time every day to come down vote me. That's fine. You can do that. Um, but I appreciate the consistency with which they do it in. <laughs> I hope they would in turn appreciate, appreciate the consistency of the, getting these shows up. But that was very nice of you to say, and you know, I wouldn't be doing this show without John Schnapp. It was always his idea for me to do my own YouTube show, and I, I quite enjoy it. You know, I keep thinking, oh, I'm going to hang up my spurs, but no, I the everybody's letters keep getting more interesting. It's, it's really interesting to talk about these topics, and I'm I'm I wouldn't do it if I wasn't having fun. You know, one of the to be honest, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this and develop a, a YouTube audience was to promote my other things. Like this morning, I was working on. Of course, Lucas Kendall's film that he wrote and directed, the short Sky Fighter, that was done as a proof of concept short for uh, the feature that I edited, is going up on the Dust Network, I think, in January. So you'll be able to see it. It's a 15-minute short, but it's pretty cool. And I'm really proud of the work that we did. Um, Tobias Richter, who did the effects for Axanar, did the effects in the movie. And and I'm really, really proud of it. And, and uh, I'm glad it's going up. So this morning... You know, I was working on on our delivery after the, the 5.1 delivery and the two the two channel stereo delivery. There's a lot of I was doing the deliverables for the Dust Network, and um, you know, I, I keep thinking like, oh, I, I could be doing more to promote this channel and making more more videos and 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 stuff and cross promote and grow the channel, which I do want to do. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to uh, not grow this channel, but but I mean, my God, if I got either I, I'm pulled in different directions, whether it's Tango Shalom, whether it's Sky Fighter whether it's this documentary, I'm making a documentary on Ebola, which is really amazing. I didn't shoot it, I'm cutting it. My friend Frank has gone to the Ebola zone. He's going back to the Ebola zone, I think this month. Uh, incredible. So I'm working on these different things. And if, if I wasn't, I would spend more time doing more on this. I keep wanting to move on to my set and, and have the opening title sequence I did for observations, which I think I'm gonna do and bring more people on. But anyway, ultimately, thank you for your very kind comments. Uh, I very much appreciated that. This next letter comes from Koba, our favorite ape. Hello, RMB. Today I wish to discuss a trend I am seeing and honestly am starting to get annoyed by, and that is movies and TV shows and other forms of media using already established IPs to sell you something new. And a good example of this is the most recent Watchmen TV series. Why is this called Watchmen? Call this show something else. Give it an original title. Because while the first episode is only out, it wasn't half bad. However, where it did fail was it was called Watchmen. I had similar problems with the recent Joker movie. Amazing film, but why is it Joker? 
Star Trek Discovery. I've often said, call this show by any other name, and I'd probably enjoy it. But it's not, it's not Star Trek, meaning it has to fit into Star Trek canon, but it doesn't. And that's what ruins it. It's also why I'm a massive fan of the Orville. It's an homage to Star Trek, to be sure, but it's still its own thing, and that's great. Let the writers, directors, and actors be creative. I worry for this new Lord of the Rings show. It may very well be an amazing fantasy TV show. However, it may get damaged simply because it is called Lord of the Rings. Now, I'm not saying that you can't do more spinoffs and adaptations of existing IPs. Heck, some stuff's great. I like Star Trek novels and Doctor Who audios by Big Finish. But you have to be careful while doing those for them to work. You need a deep understanding of the source material and a good understanding for the canon. The thing is, we hear people constantly crying out for new original ideas. And if we are getting them, they're just being butchered into exist uh, there, and we are getting them. But some are just being butchered into existing material that they do not fit in. Truly, your good ape friend, Koba. Well, you know, it's funny. It's it's I think it's interesting. Like everything in our risk averse culture, I would have thought. Like, I'll give it up for Jeff Johns for calling his story about bringing Watchmen into the DC universe Doomsday Clock. It was called Doomsday Clock. Now, it wasn't called Watchmen Doomsday Clock. It was called Doomsday Clock. Okay, they ripped off the, the layout, the panel design, the graphic look of everything. <laughs> they completely ripped off the Watchmen comic. So they call it Doomsday Clock instead of Watchmen, but it certainly looked like the Watchmen comic in every way, shape, and form. But at least it was called Doomsday Clock. I mean, it would have been interesting when they're calling Watchmen the show Watchmen. It, Like you said, it's not really Watchmen. It's this sequel to the Watchmen comic. It's not... It's So I don't disagree with you. I think I might have enjoyed... I thought Watchmen was intriguing. I thought it was very heavy-handed, and uh, it was very didactic, and I'm being hit over the head. I understand. I mean, it's funny. Going back and watching the Watchmen movie last night, there was something, maybe I don't I don't remember this in the comic, but it did, the Minutemen, the precursors to the Watchmen, the Minutemen started as cops. They were cops before they became costumed heroes, and they were cops that first wore masks and meted out vigilante justice. Uh, met out, met it out. Uh, yes. So that was interesting. I'm like, okay. So the idea of the police force wearing masks is not something that is, is new to this series. You're really going back to the roots of Watchmen, but I, you know, I agree. I, I think there's an expectation. I mean, the fact that we have Ozymandias and clearly Dr. Manhattan's around, and I'm sure it's going to play somehow into the, into the comic or into the show we shall see. But I think you're right. I mean, I look, the idea Star Trek had a good thing going where they kept going forward into the future to create new Star Trek shows. It worked for 25 seasons in 18 years, very effectively. Yes, the creative, uh, let's face it, Rick Berman and Brandon Braga overstayed their welcome and they were a little burnt out and they didn't ha have exactly something new to bring to the proceedings. You know, Manny Cotto did what Enterprise should have done in the first place, which was go back and look at the founding of the Star Trek universe, but they finally got around to it. But now, you know, going back to the time of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, it's just, I agree with you. It's, you're not adhering to canon. You don't, it doesn't look like that. You're, you're going back and you're, you're literally reinventing the original. For what purpose? You're reinventing it to our time and it's just, it's not working. I, 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 I think you're right. I get, I get, it bums me out too, damn it. Koba, I'm right there with you. Uh, but, you know, risk averse IPs, it's easier, it's easier to go back and, and, and get somebody to give you money to make something if there's already an existing IP to base it on. Um, Jeffrey Mao says, I pick seats next to the handicap spots. They're rarely taken. Some of my favorite seats in the Cinerama are next to handicap spots. spots. You're supposed to give them up if handicap people come in, which I understand, but a lot of the time they don't. Uh, Echo Base Network says it take uh, two takes from your chat with Jeremy. Battle Zone on PC is awesome and is currently on Steam. And the Alien versus Predator comics were one of my favorites. Well, first of all, Echo Base Network, I did not know 
that the bat for those of you who don't know, I've said it before, one of my favorite video games, if not my most favorite video game of all time, was Activision's reboot of Battlezone in the late 90s, 98. It was amazing because it was an, a real-time strategy game and a first-person shooter rolled into one. And the premise of the game, obviously, it was based on the old 3D vector graphics battle zone from the early 80s, but they did it uh, with, with new graphics. And the premise was is that the Soviet Union and the United States, the Soviet Union never fell and the space race continued. And you would you're battling on different planets. And in the show, you battled on the moon, you battled on Venus. And what was cool was you had to build your bases and your bases would, you had to mine ore or whatever to build your tanks and you had to fight the Soviets and then destroy their base. And what was so great about it, you were in hover tanks. So you were first person and you could get out of the hover tank. You could even, if you wanted to climb up on like a rock outcropping, use your sniper rifle and shoot the pilot of a Soviet tank, get in the Soviet tank and infiltrate their base just to take a look around. But what was so much fun with that was the physics, the physics of that game, the way the hover tanks worked in various gravity environments. It was such a great game. I played that game incessantly during the time I was editing Free Enterprise, and I was so stressed wondering, oh my God, have I bitten off more than I could chew? So I spent a lot of time playing Battlezone in and out of my editing sessions with Free Enterprise. Um, I didn't know that it was on Steam. I think I'm going to have to go take a look and play it again because, man, did I love that game. And then, of course, the Aliens versus Predator comics, the first series that Dark Horse published, should have been the movie. But it wasn't, because why would anybody do that? It's so ironic to me that the MCU will go back and they'll take, whether it's Winter Soldier or Age of Ultron, they'll take actual comic book storylines as inspiration for the comic book movies they make. And yet, Star Wars won't, or Alien or Predator won't, when there's been so many great Alien and Predator stories done in comic form by Dark Horse. Amazing stuff. I'm glad they were one of your favorites, Echo Base, because they are great. Uh, Suthia says, hey, Mr. B, you doing no shave November early? Keep it. <laughs> well, Suthius, I was thinking about it, but you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Lucky Tiger men's grooming products on my beard because I want to see what that's like and I want to make a, a Lucky Tiger, an actual Lucky Tiger little uh, commercial for my viewers because they've been very, very good to me. Word Balloon says, only Night Owl was a cop in the Watchmen comic. Well, wait a minute. I'm talking about Hollis Mason, who wrote uh, Under the Hood, the, oh, the first Night Owl. Um, he, he talked about how we, well, at least he said in the movies last night, he said we were cops, and then uh, they were vigilantes, and then other people joined in. You might be right, though, John. I don't want to... I don't want to dispute that, but Hollis Mason talked about how the first the first masked heroes were former cops. Um, anyway, um, Willow Yang. Uh, by the way, John Suntress is here from the Word Balloon Podcast. Uh, if you guys aren't listening to the Word Balloon Podcast, you should. It's a great pop culture podcast. Uh, I don't know if John has had uh, Jonathan Hickman on, but man, I want to hear that guy talk X Men, brah. <sighs> yes. Um, Willow Yang is here. Hello, Willow. Willow says, did you like Terminator 1 or Terminator 2 more? Terminator 1 was great, but Terminator 2 made me cry. I hope that Dark Fate performs well for Paramount's sake. Well, Willow, I have to say, I still love the first Terminator the most because it was new and no one had ever seen it, and I didn't know what to expect, and it blew my, it blew my doors off. Uh, I love the film. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There's no doubt Terminator 2 is... is not i love it's excellent you know it's a groundbreaking first hundred million dollar movie groundbreaking effects for the time i really loved terminator 2 i didn't make me cry but as far as a piece of low budget genre cinema terminator 1 was a groundbreaking piece of work it was so so significant and so many people sort of looked at it and ripped it off and i really really loved um i really loved terminator 1 Really good stuff. Uh, let's see. Looking at, I've got so many letters. So many letters. So many letters. Uh, this one, let's see. No, I already read that one. Um, this one comes from Ryan Gomez. Ryan Gomez says, yo, Rob, new subscriber here. Saw you on Geeks and, Geeks and Gamers, and I thought you and Jeremy had a good conversation. 
I was watching your latest live stream and you mentioned a story about Ken motherfucking Foray. Great story. I was laughing the whole time. Dawn of the Dead is my ha- favorite horror film of all time. I've got two questions for you. First, do you have any Dawn of the Dead collectibles? And second, when are we going to get a four-pack style Mezco set with Peter, Roger, Fran, and Flyboy? I've been wanting these figures for a long time. Keep up the good work. And thanks, Rob. Ryan G. Ryan Gomez. Well, Ryan, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. I, Dawn of the Dead is, is one of my favorite, not just favorite horror films, but favorite movies of all time. And the Mezco uh, 112 scale, I did get, obviously, um, uh, Steven as, as Flyboy as the zombie and the helicopter zombie two-pack. But you're right. I mean, I've wanted hot toys of Peter, Fran, Steven, and Roger. I have wanted 12-inch Dawn of the Dead figures. I don't know if anyone will make them. People are always making the zombie figures. They've never made, or some people, maybe they did make a four-pack, but because they're just two SWAT officers and two civilians, I, I don't see that happening. I wish it would, because any respectable person that is a Dawn of the Dead fan wants those figures. So <clears throat> I'm right there with you. As far as Dawn of the Dead collectibles... I've had a few figures over the years. The one thing I really like is a poster book, a Dawn of the Dead poster book that was published. I don't know if it was in the late 70s. I think it was in the early 80s. It's a big fold-out poster book that's like a – those. they don't really make poster books much anymore, <clears throat> but they used to. They were like magazines, and the whole thing would fold out into a big poster. And the poster is really cool, but then it was articles about Dawn of the Dead. And it was – there was a uh, an old – media science fiction media magazine that not a lot of people remember called quest star and they published the company the company that published quest star published this and so and then i i also have a, a dawn of the dead uh both dvd and laserdisc collection of various releases of dawn of the dead on those formats i don't know why i keep i keep buying them uh i don't know why i just i have such a dawn of the dead fetish uh, there's just not much out for it. And I did sell one of my favorite collectibles. I had an Italian four sheet. It was like, which are about like 50, I think 55 inches by 55 inches. I had in Italy, the movie was called zombie and it was beautiful painted artwork. And I, I sold that actually to the, the third floor. I had all my big, I had about a hundred thousand dollar movie poster collection that I sold. It was all big paper, three sheets, six sheets. And uh, it's at the third floor. If you ever make a movie in Hollywood, a big comic book movie, there's a previous company called The Third Floor. If you look around at all the posters they have there, that was my collection. Uh, they're great. I mean, Zardoz, James Bond, I had a great collection. Um, and I, I could one day again. But it's great. I, they took it off my hands. They asked for it. And um, I figured more people are going to get to see those posters than anywhere else. So why not? Suthia says, does an IP need to be in canon throughout its different iterations. Take Transformers, for example. There have been various iterations since Generation 1, not all canon to each other, and still called Transformers. Great question. The answer is no. No. However, here's here's one of the things that I think that both Star Wars and Star Trek has done. Oh, first of all, let me back up. One of my favorite anime, my favorite anime, not my favorite anime series of all time, that's Legends of the Galactic Heroes, but but if you look at Gundam, Gundam has a continuity, a singular continuity in the Universal Century. Now, the Universal Century is where Gundam began. We went back to the Universal Century with Gundam Unicorn, and there's a number of different Gundam shows that are set in the Universal Century. And that's important. Um, and I think that uh, then there's a lot like Gundam Wing, which started its own continuity from scratch, or Turn A Gundam, which isn't really in Universal Century continuity. There's Gundam Seed, Gundam Build Fighters, but you know that they're not in the Universal Century uh, uh, continuity. Star Trek had a continuity. Uh, it, that's just how it happened from the original series all the way up through the end of Enterprise. Canonical Star Trek. It ran from 66 to 2005. Now, I don't necessarily think 
that a, a franchise, an IP, you can have all kinds of different continuities. But what Star Trek did, what they've done in the last 10 years since J.J. Abrams' 2009 Star Trek, is they've gone back and tried to reestablish. I mean, 2009 is you've got canonical Spock going to a different time period and meeting Kirk and Spock again and retell in a different universe into a different continuity, and yet it's still canonical Spock. So canonical Spock's future was to go back in time to a different universe. So he's not going back in time. He's actually just, just he just goes into a different universe. So Spock's future, canonical Spock's future was to branch off and go to this other universe. But I think what Star Trek Discovery did was it, it went back in time and it said, no, this is canonical Star Trek, but then didn't do anything to adhere to canon, which I think was a big mistake. That's not, you can't say you're canonical and then not make it canonical. I mean, you just, that's not, it's not canonical Star Trek. You can't go and change everything because that would be like me going back and, and making a World War II movie and saying, oh, there's jet fighters here or there's different technology than there was. And I, I, I think that you can have all kinds of, just like Gundam, Gundam, you're seeing different iterations of what Gundam could be. And if Discovery wanted to go back and 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 just flat out say, this is not canonical Star Trek, this is a different thing, but we're going to go back and re-examine characters from the past, I wouldn't have had a problem with that. But they've said it's canonical. It's not, look, in my mind, Discovery is not canonical Star Trek. There's no way it can be. You can't tell me it's canonical when it's clearly not. The Starship Enterprise that is in Discovery is not the Starship Enterprise. It's not canonical Star Trek. You can you can have a character that's called Spock. It's not Leonard Nimoy. It's not canonical. So in my own head canon or whatever, it, it just doesn't work. And I think that's the problem that I think as a long-term, a long-time fan, being told something's canonical that isn't uh is problematic, I think. Um, and I don't understand why 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 people do it. I think Gundam is an elegant way to do it. Battlestar Galactica, they went back and they reinvented the Galactica IP. I loved Battlestar Galactica, but you know, it has interesting ties, winks, and nods to the original Battlestar Galactica. But it's clearly something different that takes the IP into a different direction. I don't understand. I even suggested on my own Tumblr, I think I've written two things on my Tumblr blog that they should go back to basics and reinvent Star Trek from the ground up, not unlike Battlestar Galactica. Retell the story of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, but you know you still have to do it well, not ham-fistedly like they did with J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. So I do think that um, you don't have to at all, but don't tell your fans that this is supposed to be now considered canonical when it is not. Because I think that's that's really disingenuous and you're what you're doing is you're thumbing your nose at, at your audience and why do that um i i i don't understand why you would do that uh this next one comes from phil anastasio viceroy this is phil but please refer to me as marso as marso okay marso i have a brother in politics that's a reference to fear and loathing in las vegas anywho i hope all is well with you and my brothers and sisters in the post geek singularity I just saw the John Campion show where you, John, and Chris discussed the debut of the final Star Wars trailer. I couldn't help but crack a smile every time John got excited about the Star Destroyer breaking through the ice. I could only imagine what was going on through your mind, but your attempts to stay emotionless while on the sc split screen were priceless. <laughs> I was that transparent, eh? <laughs> the more I see and hear about the trailer and the movie itself, it just makes me wonder if this movie is going to be satisfying. I'm sure it'll be entertaining, even if you don't like J.J. Abrams' approach or style. But will it answer the questions presented in the two previous films? The film has its work cut out for it. Many holes to fill. Will the film's runtime allow for adequate hole filling? Will J.J. Abrams even address these questions? Or will he hope that lens flares and spaceships skimming along a planet's surface will be enough to distract viewers? Do you think the rise of Skywalker will provide closure? I hope <laughs> is I hope this piece of cinema is satisfying. Be good to each other. Marceau El Flacco. <laughs> well, Marceau, let me just say, first of all, thanks for writing in. 
Look, my whole problem is whatever story they're telling in The Rise of Skywalker has not been built up. The return of Palpatine certainly wasn't teased in the previous two movies. So basically what I've said, look, I, I want it to be good. I do. I want I want to I want to go into a Star Wars movie and love it. I want to love it. Why is that so hard? I want to love 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 this movie. I honestly want to love it. But the story they're telling other than whatever's going on between Rey and Kylo Ren, which I feel has already been it doesn't look like it's moving forward at all. Kylo's going to have his whole thing with the Knights of Ren and they're going to go look for whatever Jedi Holocron MacGuffin they're looking for and then there's going to be I mean, to me it seems like this movie is about Rey and Kylo Ren. Everybody else are supporting characters. And then they're going to end up battling the Emperor, uh, Palpatine. And they're going to get helped by force ghosts of everybody else. And uh, Rey will win. Uh, that, that to me is like, okay. I want it to be more than that. Look, hope springs eternal. Uh, it's always good to have hope. I always have hope. I always want things to be good. Please be good. But I don't know if they can be. Um, Stubble McShave says, I always notice the sound effects of the dirt bike in the garage in T2. Connor does a long engine rev, but the, the sound is short revs. It breaks the illusion for me. <laughs> well, Stubble, that is a very funny thing to say. I, um, <laughs> I like that. I think that's actually pretty great. Pretty great. Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I have work to do. I have more continued work to do. So I'm going to bring this chat, Rob Observations, chat number 258 to a close. I have many letters to get to, which I will get to tomorrow. I promise it'll probably be an all-letter show tomorrow because there's a lot of stuff. But I want to thank my moderators, Detective Jim. I've got a new moderator that I have to make a moderator. And Greg. And, of course, Terry, the Sheriff of Nottingham, and the Honorable Mike Bodden, who is fighting for his life to become mayor of Riverdale, Iowa, for another term. So he's been sort of absent. That's why the website hasn't been updated as much as possible. But it will be. And Ali State's new column, The Feminine Nerd Gaze, is dropping shortly. Look for that on the website. And I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for all of my new subscribers. If you like this channel, please hit like. Please subscribe. And uh, it's just great having everybody that's come over from Geeks and Gamers. And thank you all for the very kind messages. I very much appreciate it. Uh, if you do want to send me letters, please go to the burnetwork.net website and send them. Boy, do I have a lot to get through. And again, I want to thank you for everything you're doing. Thanks for all the support on the channel. Remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And with that, I say, have a better day.